Well, it's that time of year. You know what season it is? Pumpkin spice season is upon us. And I know you feel it. Any pumpkin spice fans in here at all? Okay, we have, we have a few. Uh, some of you ladies, the second the temperature dropped below 74, I know what you did. You threw on a flannel and you raced down to Starbucks to get like a pumpkin latte or something. You're like, you know who you are. I know who you are too, wearing your vest and duck boots. Or Uggs, are Uggs still a thing? Is that like out now? But uh, anyway, pumpkin spice, it, uh, get this, brings in half a, mil- half a billion, sorry, not half a million, half a billion dollars every year. Every year, half a billion. Not from me. I don't like it. My, my wife, she's into it. Our fridge has a pumpkin spice creamer in it. I noticed the other day. I was like, what the heck is this? She's like, it's October, babe. It's October. Like, that means nothing to me. Like, does October means that we have to have crappy creamer now in the house? I just, I, I can't get into it. That and my wife drinks um, chai tea. Any chai tea drinkers in here at all? I can't stand this stuff. When, when Nicole and I, we went to, we went to college, to get, freshman year of college together up in, up in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, we were just dating. And so like a sweet girlfriend, she shows up to our philosophy class with a cup of chai tea for me, claiming that it's a life-changing drink, this chai tea. You have to try it. I took a sip, spit it out. It's like, you take my grandma's potpourri and pour it in here? Like, I, this is like, it tastes like my grandma's house. And I know how this goes. After service, some of you are going to come up to me and be like, I have a chai tea recipe that you're going to have to try. It is different. I don't care what potpourri you are steeping. Just not a fan of chai tea. But you can like it. You can certainly like it. That's the whole idea. This whole idea of taste is just kind of a funny thing. We all have very, very, very different tastes. My middle daughter... She is, she's eight, and she eats half a block of feta cheese every morning for breakfast. And she's been doing it since, she's, since she was two. She's just got that like bougie palate. Uh, but not only do we have different tastes, but tastes change. When I was a kid, I used to love those individually wrapped cheese slices. You know what I'm talking about? Um, it's not even cheese. I don't even know how I liked it, but uh, it's, it's not even cheese, but my, our taste changed because I hate it now. Uh, my girls, I think about my girls, I, I take my girls out on, on dates and it's one of my favorite things to do. And I love how excited they get, you know, they kind of plan things out, what they're going to wear and where they're going to go out to eat. And, and when they were little, it was always like kid food. Wherever we're going to go out to eat, it's always fast food, you know, chicken nuggets. It's like, that's the finest dining, dad. Just like chicken nuggets, hot date for, for chicken nuggets. As they're getting older, though, the dates are becoming more fun for me. So like last time I took my oldest out on a date and she chose Middle Eastern food. It's like, all right, girl, now we're talking. I love this. Because her palate is developing as she grows into this, this young woman. And so our tastes and our appetites, they grow with maturity. As we get older, our tastes, they mature as well. Usually, I still love blue raspberry blow pops, though. Still love those. Ever since I was a kid, I love those. And nerds. Love, love nerds. I still have a lot of growing up to do. But as we grow, as we grow up, as we get older, our tastes change. And this is, this is how Jesus actually talks about our inner growth. Our spiritual growth, or lack thereof, is influenced by the tastes that we all have as we go throughout life. And some of us, and we might not even see this in ourselves, but some of us have been stuck spiritually. And one of the main issues that we're facing is that we just have bad taste. And this is the conversation that Jesus wants to have. So Matthew chapter five is where we're gonna be. Matthew chapter five, we're gonna look at verse six today. It's page eight or nine in the Bibles and chairs. Really encourage you to grab one of those Bibles in Matthew chapter five. We've been on the same page of scripture for four weeks. We're pretty slow around here. Or we just have a very slow lead teaching pastor. But either way, regardless, here we are. And so we're just going to jump right into this. Let me pray. God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the pages that we hold in our hand. Words from you, from our creator, from dad. And Father, may you remind us that this is a huge moment right here. Maybe the biggest moment all week. We get to hear from you corporately as a family, hearing from dad. Father, we know that you'll speak. We know that you'll convict. As you bring, as your Holy Spirit brings situations to mind, may we not fight them off, but may we be completely submitted to your word and open to what you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the lens of scripture of Matthew chapter five or six zooms in, we find ourselves on that hill that we've been on for the last four weeks. The sun moves toward its peak, ushering in the sweltering heat of the day. This hill sits below sea level, and the spot just roasts during the afternoon. 
One by one, the crowd begins to throw thin hoods over their head to protect themselves from the relentless rays beating down on them. A few families make little makeshift tents for shade. They're in it for the long haul. The entire crowd grows thirsty as they sweat it out. Not just thirsty, but this dry, parched, craving thirst. And the glimmering water right behind Jesus almost teases us. The water jars that weight down the picnic blankets are less and less full with time. And as Jesus sits on the rock and teaches the crowd, he reads us like a book and he speaks to the current feeling. And he says this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Now, so far, Jesus' sermon would not be rated very highly on Rotten Tomatoes. Because if you just think about what he said so far in these last four weeks, what has Jesus hit so far? He said, uh, be poor in spirit. So Jesus, go tell a bunch of poor people, hey, you're going to be happy if you see that you're also spiritually poor as well. Oh, and also you need to mourn. And then you need to act humble and lowly and meek. And now Jesus says, oh yeah, and be hungry. Like, let's just shoot straight for a second. If we were to stay here at, sur- at surface level on, on reading this, we'd think, we'd think like, come on, Jesus. Like, read your audience. They are poor, they are oppressed, they are hungry people. Like, what are you doing? They already feel all of that. This is insensitive right here to use this kind of language. But as we've been seeing so far in this text and in the series, Jesus is being methodically brilliant. He's speaking directly to a physical need that they feel and that they live with deeply. And then he's relating that to spiritual matters. So readers of this can be, we can often be guilty of missing just the brilliance of what's going on here. I'll put it this way. There's a, there's a big difference between a teacher and a great teacher. Isn't there? Growing up, like we all had teachers and uh, not all of our teachers were great, but there were a few great ones, weren't there? And they just kind of stuck out, just those few great teachers. And they stuck out for a couple of reasons. First off, maybe they cared or they reached out or you know, they sacrificed. But one of the big things that sets apart a teacher from a great teacher is the ability to do what Jesus is doing right here. To take a felt need, poverty, hunger, and use that as a teaching tool. It's kind of like the magic school bus. You ever watch this show? Miss Frizzle, she was one of my first crushes. She's like adventurous, funky outfits. Her and Mary Poppins just had my heart when I was little. But Miss Frizzle wasn't just a looker. She was like the best teacher. And it's why we would tune in to watch, to watch Miss Frizzle because each episode was scripted the same way. There was a problem in the class. There's a problem with one of the students. One of them is sick. And so now Miss Frizzle is going to use what they are feeling, that sickness, and use it as a bigger, as a tool to teach this greater or this bigger lesson. So for example, it's like, oh no, Ralphie, the, the, the little kid in the class, he's sick. Let's shrink the bus down to battle Ralphie's virus and let's learn about how the body fights infections. So we're gonna take that felt need, like what was on their mind, what they're already thinking about, what they feel the sense of urgency about, and we're gonna leverage that to teach a memorable lesson. And the students would learn through not just head knowledge, but they would feel the teaching. So you might be able to get this and be like, all right, Junior, did you just compare Jesus to Miss Frizzle? Sort of. But she's made up and she's scripted by a team of writers. Jesus is not made up. And he was the first to do that. All that to say, my goodness, Magic School Bus and the Beatitudes. How is our church growing? God, no other way. <laughs> all that to say, This is Jesus' approach to the Beatitudes. He's bringing up something that all of these faces in the crowd that they're feeling, poverty, hunger, thirst, and then he uses that to teach a greater greater issue. Now it's not just a topic that they're listening to, head knowledge. No, now they, they feel that because you're using the need that I feel every single day that I live with. And so Jesus says, hunger and thirst. Now, there's this massive theological implication here that Jesus is is making. But before we get to that massive theological implication that he's making, we need to talk about one word, one more word in this this verse. I'm just gonna kind of Tarantino this verse just a little bit, kind of go out of order here. Let's just put a pin in hunger and thirst for a second. And we're gonna hit this churchy word, righteousness. Righteousness. And we'll, we'll come back to hunger and thirst in just a second. Today, we don't hear righteousness like really outside of church circles, do we? It's kind of like a religious word. 
I guess maybe like surfers, you know, righteous, bro. I just sounded like Wyatt there for a second. But <laughs> outside, of, outside of that, this is just kind of seen as like more of a, this religious, this, this churchy word. Uh, righteousness, though, especially like the wording that Jesus is using here as he's teaching, he's not using a, a religion, an overtly religious word. Righteousness just means what is right. At its basic, simple definition. Morally right, simple definition. Now, having said that, in Scripture, there are two kinds of righteousness. So what we're going to do right now is we're actually going to head into this theological sidebar for a second, kind of head into seminary for just a second, but this really, this really does matter. In Scripture, there are two types of righteousness. The first type of righteousness, and this is in your notes, but it might be worth writing down. The first type of righteousness in Scripture, biblical righteousness, is legal righteousness. Now, some might call it internal righteousness, and that's fine too, but we're just going to go with legal righteousness. Legal righteousness is given to us by Jesus Christ. So Jesus' death and resurrection made it possible for you and I to be declared legally right before God. It is not based on what we could have done or do. It is all based on what Jesus did on the cross and the empty tomb. It is a beautiful thing. So that's the first type of righteousness, legal But then there's a second type of righteousness, biblical righteousness, called personal righteousness. Now, others call it external, so like internal and external, but we're just going to go with personal righteousness. Personal righteousness is once we've received Jesus' righteousness, that legal righteousness, we then produce good works. We produce good things. So Jesus declared me right before God, legally right before God. I don't deserve it. It's all based on Jesus. But now I can produce right things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. And so the question then becomes, as we're looking at this, like as Jesus is teaching, he says, you need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. The question is, is what type of righteousness is Jesus saying we need to hunger for? It's a trick question because it's both. Now, there's a big debate among denominations about this. Churches will actually kind of battle about this and they fight and they divide. Some will say, no, no, Jesus is talking about legal righteousness and others will say, no, he's talking about personal righteousness. Um, But the problem is, is that as soon as you separate, especially in this context, personal and legal righteousness, you have really big problems. Without the righteousness that Jesus gives us, it's works-based salvation. This is the churches or the, the religions that say, you need to work your way to God. You need to produce you know, you have to have enough personal righteousness to, to get salvation. We, that, that's just wrong. We need legal righteousness and we get legal righteousness through Jesus Christ. But without personal righteousness, it's easy believism. Just like, hey, believe in God and then do whatever you want. There's a lot of people today. Just, well, I just believe in God and do whatever I want. That's wrong. Faith without works is dead. So legal and, and personal righteousness, they work together. And so what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, blessed or happy is the one who hungers to be right with God because he is fully and finally satisfied in Jesus Christ. But now once they are fully and finally satisfied with Jesus Christ, once they are right with God, we are then sent on this journey where I have this healthy hunger in me to live and to do what's right, to have right relationships, love, patience, generosity, because Jesus gives me righteousness, that then stirs in me to then produce righteousness. So that's righteousness. Now, let's take the pin back out of hunger and thirst and let's go back to hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst. Something these, fa- these faces experience every single day. Jesus, again, he's taking that, fi- that physical felt need and then he's using that to convey a spiritual pursuit. And this is nothing earth shattering, but I just want to sit in this, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You ever experience real hunger? Like when you see the word hunger, what comes to mind? For me, what comes to mind when I think of hunger is I think of every Tuesday at 1130. That is my hungry time every week. Tuesdays are my meeting days. I, if I eat breakfast, it's usually around 5 a.m., and then my first meeting is at 7.30. And then from all morning, the, the meeting just kind of gets larger and larger and larger. By 11 o'clock, it's like our whole staff, 40, you know, some of us. And then by 11.30, my stomach is growling. And it's like embarrassed, like loud growling. All I can think about is the sushi special down the street. Uh, get me there, like the two crunchy rolls and the wasabi. And I am, I am, it's all I can think about. In fact, so much so that I'll come back to the office after lunch and be like, I got to reread the staff meeting notes because I couldn't focus. It's like, all I could think about was, was food. Just like, get me those crunchy rolls and wasabi. That's my hunger. 
That's not, like to be clear, that's not these people's hunger that Jesus is talking to. When Jesus said hunger, these people weren't thinking of, oh, a little hunger pang during a meeting. What came to their mind was seeing their kids' ribs during weeks of less. On a rainy day, like we just had today, on a rainy day when work is rained out and they're huddled inside their house, they're not thinking, hey, nice day off. They're thinking, no, today's rainy day could mean next week's hunger. Like it was not uncommon for families to go days in a row with nothing. Like they knew, they know hunger. They know weak, fatigued, inability to focus, nausea, headache, hunger. And that kind of hunger is extremely powerful. That kind of hunger drives a man to do things he would never normally ever even dream of doing. Case in point, 1972. You remember this? Or maybe you saw the, the documentary, the movie on this, is the Uruguayan rugby team that crashed into the Andes Mountains. And many had died in the, the plane crash, but many actually lived from the crash. And they were stranded on that mountain for 72 days. 72 days with nothing to eat because everything is frozen. Their hunger became so strong, they resorted to eating their dead. Teammates, like friends, they ate them. The story made world headlines and, and many read the reports responding like, I would never ever do that. And they'd interview these men afterwards and these men were weeping saying, I, I would never have saw myself ever doing that. I don't wanna talk about it, but it's the only reason that we're alive. Like my hunger made me do that. And it caused a, really a, a global conversation. Could you ever do that? In fact, my wife and I, we were watching the documentary together and uh, afterwards, you know, my wife asked me, she's like, could you ever, could you ever eat me? <laughs> and I said, for sure. <laughs> but I wouldn't. I would use her as bait and I'd catch a polar bear, maybe like make a net out of her hair or something. And so I was telling her my plan, conversation ended there. But the whole story of the Uruguayan rugby team sparked this big conversation. Could you do what they did? And most people flat out said, no. In fact, some of you are shaking your heads. There's like absolutely no way we would ever do that. It, but it's really hard to say that when you have an experience and you've, we've never known that deep hunger where you've gone weeks without eating. True hunger drives you to do things you would never normally ever dream of doing. Like real hunger is one of, if not the most powerful feelings. I don't know. You could even maybe argue possibly more than love. We'll do crazy things for love. Last weekend, my wife ran the Chicago Marathon. The girls all made signs. And uh, I posted this, but I, I bought this shirt. I'm really proud of this shirt. So um, I, <laughs> I put this shirt on and my mother-in-law was waiting in my living room for us to go downtown. She was like, I'm gonna walk with you wearing that shirt. I was like, yeah. And then she started laughing. I was like, I'm glad you had that reaction. <laughs> But I even got on TV with, with this shirt. But, you know, I'm still walking around with my mother-in-law all around, all around Chicago wearing the shirt because I'm going to do crazy things for my wife because I love her. I was just telling somebody in the, the lobby, like, I don't like going downtown. I don't like the city. I don't like running, but it's my wife and I love her. So I'm going to go into a packed place full of runners to cheer on my wife because I, I love her. We'll do crazy things out of love. But interestingly enough, Jesus does not use the term love here. He doesn't say, hey, love righteousness. He says, no, I want you to hunger. I want you to thirst, to do what's right, to have this craving in you, this craving that you can't shake. I need to do what's right. See, the hungrier a person gets, the more tunnel vision they get to food. The hungrier you get, the less and less you care about your image, about drama, about politics, about whatever else is around you, the only agenda item is I need to fill my stomach. Not much else matters. But I fear that too many Jesus followers, and to be candid, too many of us, our pursuit of righteousness does not resemble hunger very much. Our pursuit of what's right often comes out of convenience. Oh, we wanna do what's right. But the problem is we have our own agenda. Yeah, we want to look good and, and we want to be respected and, and we want to grow our career and we want to capitalize on opportunities and we want to make money. We want to save money. And none of that is bad. It's like those are healthy desires, but often they weigh heavier to us than doing what's right. Or am I the only guilty one? 
Like, I'm ashamed to say it. I guess I got nothing to lose. I told you about Miss Frizzle in my shirt. So I'll tell you this story too. Um, this, this summer, a friend of mine invited me to speak at a small gathering in Berlin. It was nothing crazy. You know, it wasn't going to like get paid or anything, but, but it sounded fun. It's like, all right, you're going to put me up in Germany. I'll come to Germany. Sign me up. Committed. Let's go. Then two weeks ago, I got an invite to speak at a conference out west for the same exact date. I got so excited. It's like, it's a beautiful hiking area. It was a pretty big gathering. I was going to get paid for it. It was an opportunity to get my book to that part of the country. It's like one of those opportunities that you wait for and then you just jump on. But I committed to that like smaller, you know, no money thing. And I'm embarrassed, but immediately I went into trying to weasel my way out of my commitment because of my own agenda. It was like finding excuses. And I was doing a pretty good job of justifying myself until my wife asked me, she's like, honey, but what's the right thing? Come on, baby, why do you gotta ask me that? <laughs> she knew what was right, and I did too, but I was holding on to my agenda. And so I wasn't living with this real hunger in me to do what's right. No, I was more hungry for my own thing. And the truth is, I do this way too much. There's times where I'll slant things just a little bit to make myself look a little bit more innocent. I'll hold on to an apology because it would just be too humbling to, you know, to own up to that. So I read these words from Jesus and I think, I don't have this deep, abiding, starving hunger for living right and doing what's right to pursue right no matter what it costs me. I want to do what's right. But sometimes it depends on the cost. And Jesus is not real hunger, the kind of hunger I'm talking about. I'm talking about first century Galilee hunger. Deep hunger doesn't take much cost into account. Deep hunger just goes for it. Is that you? A few thoughts from this text. Number one, appetites direct our lives. Our appetites direct our lives. What's the old saying? You are what you eat. There's a lot of scientific truth in that. In more than one way, actually. What we eat actually becomes our physical physique. So uh, you know the term beer belly? That term is actually legit because you drink beer, those carbs are actually carried in the belly. Uh, meat and protein encourage muscle. The food we consume is actually building blocks for our bodies tomorrow. Most of us know that, but interestingly enough, there's, there's more to it. What we eat greatly impacts our mental state. This is why there's that whole idea of comfort food, right? You kind of get sad or, or upset and we run to comfort food. They kind of that temporary pick me up. You got to feel better. Unfortunately, it bites later on, making somebody feel shame and bloated as those negative emotions rush right back to them. And it's actually far worse. But foods affect our energy level and our mental state. One of the best like, pieces of diet advice I ever heard was don't eat what feels good in the moment because the fries always feel good in the moment. Come on. Instead, eat what makes you feel good an hour from now. It's like, all right, well, that's a different paradigm when it comes to consuming you know, food. Like in an hour, those fries aren't gonna feel so great. In fact, I'm gonna be tired, but that protein or that fruit, I'm gonna feel a lot better. And we are what we eat physically, but often mentally. Jesus is making the point, this is absolutely true spiritually. The truth is we consume things constantly. You spent your whole day consuming things in your spirit. Consume what we stream on TVs. We consume what we scroll on our phones. We consume what our friends tell us. We consume what we listen to on our playlists. I remember my professor in uh, college saying, and, uh, and maybe I remember it because he had a very classy British accent, but he said, he said, every song you listen to is a sermon. Every episode is a sermon. Every movie is a sermon. Every ad is is a sermon. Each has a message that is consumed by our spirit. And so what we do is we go throughout our days eating everything. And that consumption directs our lives. You literally become what you think about and where you spend your time. That's who you become. In fact, I spoke somewhere, uh, somewhere else and, and I said that, um, you know, you, you are what you think about. And this 20-year-old guy came up to me after the message and he's like, I disagree. Like, if, if that were true, you know, I, I, listen, I think about being a level 100 warlord on my video game all the time. I'm not that, though. And, and I wanted to say, well, bro, you are. It's just what you think about doesn't exist, and you don't exist living in your mama's basement playing video games all day. 
but that would have been mean. It's still true. We are what we consume. It's just true. But here's where it gets really scary. What we consume also directs our cravings. So I hate to stay in this whole like eating illustration, but Jesus brought it up. So we're just gonna stay, you know, where, where Jesus took us. What we eat determines what we crave. Then we think, hold on, Junior, that, that, that's backwards, right? Like, isn't it what we crave then determines what we eat? Because if I crave ice cream, then I'm gonna eat ice cream. Okay, sure, but it's actually a very vicious cycle. What we crave is actually connected to what we ate earlier. For example, how you wake up your stomach in the morning tells your stomach what it wants the rest of the day. So there's a study done with kids at breakfast. Big long table of kids. Some kids got sugary cereal and other kids were given like healthy omelets. The kids who ate the sugary cereal and and they tracked like their diets the rest of the day ended up consuming far, far, far more sugar during the day than the rest of the kids who had omelets. Like what they ate determined what they craved the rest of the day. I think about that every time I fill up my coffee in, the, in our office. There's an M&M jar in the office right by the coffee machine. And when I get coffee in the morning, it's a battle every single morning. And it's like, I always think like, ah, I don't wanna crave M&Ms the rest of the day because it's just pushing the snowball. And that can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing. Eat something healthy, you crave healthier things. And Jesus is saying that same exact principle is true spiritually. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes, I don't have it up here, up here but um, one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes is he said, your first job when you wake up in the morning, because when you wake up in the morning, you are flooded with just desires and, and lust. And your first job waking up in the morning is just packing all of those wild animals back, back where they go. This is why my dad told me um, when I was growing up, and I tell other guys this too, like when you wake up, get out of bed right away. Get out of bed right away. You can't just stay laying there. Your first job is to get up and get after it. Otherwise, you are attacked by all of those desires. Did you know that your brain creates 1,400 new neurons when you're sleeping? This means that when you wake up, you have 1,400 new neurons that are saying, tell me what to think. Tell me what to think. This is why I tell guys, get up, like read God's word, pray. Don't just, don't just lay there. You tell those neurons what, what to think. When you wake up, it's just like your stomach. What you fill your mind with will direct what your spirit craves the rest of the day. It's very, very powerful. If at night you have a craving for intimacy or lust, it was likely triggered by what you consumed earlier. Watch a sex-saturated movie. Now later on, dealing with the craving. What we consume directs our cravings. So I'll talk with people sometimes who are, very candid and very real. And they'll say things like, you know, Junior, I just hate it, but I feel like I've just lost a lot of interest in God. You ever feel that? You know, a year ago, I was more interested, just really easy to worship. I I was just so hungry for God's word. You know, I was serving, but I don't know what's up with me. It's just harder to read God's word now. It's just harder for me to go to church. And it's like, hey, I get it. No judgment. I get it. There's tough seasons. Real Christians are going to go through that. And usually though, it's because we started consuming something that we shouldn't. Or we are over-consuming something that isn't necessarily bad, but we're over-consuming it. And so it's like, yeah, you lost interest in church, but that's because for the last six months, 80% of your free time and your passion and your thoughts are all aimed at sports. The sports aren't bad, but if you're like over-consuming it, you're going to have less interest in God. Those new neurons that you wake up with every morning aren't being fed with the things of God to crave Him later on. What we consume directs our cravings. Actually, you ever, uh, it's that common saying, you know, you just got to get it out of your system. Sometimes we like tell that to, to, you know, like college students, hey, just get out of your system. If you crave it, just go get it, go play the field, you know, sow your wild oats, just get it all out of your system. That is bull. You don't get anything out of your system. You just lock it into your system and you crave it more because what we consume directs our cravings. And that means we can actually consume our way away from God. I love what John Piper wrote. He wrote, our first parents ate their way out of Eden and so do we. So good. Like Adam and Eve were in the presence of Almighty God. Literally ate their way out of the garden. My daughter asked me the other night, she's like, why would Adam and Eve ever do, ever eat of that tree? I said, baby, we do it every day. We do it every day. 
through Jesus Christ, God comes to us and we are invited into this beautiful connection with our creator, with God himself. But we're eating this and we're over consuming that. We're feasting on that which kills us, eating our way out of the presence of God, never satisfied. And for some of us, just an adjustment in what we're consuming would be life-changing. I was recently convicted by my dad. He's the worst. He, <laughs> he said something in a meeting a while back that I just haven't been able to shake. In fact, it's not just me because I was talking with a couple guys on, on staff and um, they brought it up. They're like, hey man, when your dad said that in that meeting, it just like ruined me. I was like, dude, me too. Like I haven't been able to forget about that. My dad said this in a meeting. He said, I try to live by this rule. If I wouldn't play that song or watch that clip in church, I won't watch it or listen to it, period. My body is a temple. And if it couldn't be played in church, it won't be consumed by my temple. It's like, dang. I immediately thought of my workout playlist. Like every morning, I start my day listening to the, like, the music that I listened to in high school, you know, like the 2005 hits that I shouldn't listen to, like Nelly, DMX, old Kanye, Pitbull, you know. And I've always justified, like, yeah, it's just workout music, right? You know, get some blood going, like, whatever. But then when he says, like, I wouldn't play it in church, but I'm allowing it in my temple, make it worse? Like right away in the morning, those 1,400 new neurons, you know what I'm telling them? Like gold digger. That's what I'm telling them right away in the morning. This is terrible. And since that meeting, I've, I've switched up the playlist. It's been an unbelievable difference. What are you consuming? Because you are. What snowballs are you pushing? Because you are. What cravings are you stirring? Because you are. It's those acts, those often mindless consumption that bring us to God or take us away from his presence. And the truth is some of us are just, we're not right. And we feel it, we feel off. We have for some time. And sometimes we'll call it like a funk or call it a season. But the truth is, you go on your recently listened to playlist, you go on your recently watched playlist, you go to those conversations that you've had with your friends and it's just like, yeah, all of that is just garbage that has been stirring cravings for so many other things that are just killing you. This is why Jesus sat on that hill that day and said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For those are the ones that are gonna be satisfied. And God is beckoning you back. I think for many of us in this room, God is saying, change your diet. Change your diet. Stir a craving for me. I'll meet you there. And I'll give you everything you want. I leave with one verse. It's a verse that God put on my heart this week, and I feel like I'm going to share it with our community. This is Paul writing to the church in Galatia. He says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. It's personal righteousness. Let's not get tired of producing that personal righteousness. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And I fear that some of us have given up. And maybe it's not that you've grown weary. It's just the things of this world are just catching your eye. And you've been using your life to just justify it all. I took a picture with my daughter last week and I noticed far, far, far more gray than I had last year. And I took the picture, we were looking at it, and we were just kind of laughing. It just hit me. Like, man, I used to, I used to love like being considered the young gun preacher on staff. I can't claim that anymore. In fact, all the younger ones tease me for being an old man. Last time I preached, I had three people separately text me, bro, you look tired. And it's like, well, I'm not. I'm just not aging well, apparently. Time is ticking. And the harvest is coming. And to be candid with you in, in many ways, I just, I can't wait. I can't wait. And I feel like this year, I, every year, I, I just feel like I can't wait even more. I just can't wait for that trumpet to sound. 
And I can't wait to be back in his presence. And as one of your pastors, I, I really want to stand next to you there. And in that moment standing with you, I want to say, hey, it was worth it, wasn't it? It was so worth it. Oh, it wasn't easy. Hungering for what's right in a world full of wrong. Saying no to all the trash. Sacrificing at every bend and living faithful and loving his church and serving at every opportunity and applying his word and fighting temptation. Man, that life was a fight. But boy, we stayed hungry, didn't we? And it was worth it, wasn't it? Church, let's live hungry. Live hungry for what's right. Every year, let's be hungrier. Hungrier than ever. So that on that day, because that day is coming, on that day when the trumpet sounds and we stand face to face with the one who said these words, we won't shrink back. No, because we stand in the very presence of the one we spent our life hungering for. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Father, we thank you so much that you satisfy. We thank you for putting on flesh, coming to us, teaching us these words, but also giving us that legal righteousness from the cross and the empty tomb. We thank you that we can be declared righteous before you. Father, may that stir in us like never before, a personal righteousness to produce right relationships, to do what's right. Father, stir in us a craving for more. In fact, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I just want to ask you, is there so what question? How does your diet need to change? If God convicts you like he convicts me, sometimes we can read this text and there can be shows that come to mind that we've gotta, we've gotta start saying no to, music that we've gotta take off playlists, books that we've gotta get rid of, maybe even conversations that we just need to stop because it's just stirring cravings that we shouldn't have. Where is God convicting you of your diet? Father, you are better. You always have been. You always will be. May we see it. May we taste it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.